following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. We are back. Box score from the old garden at Needix on 49th Street. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and um, we got a panel of guests that can't be beat. David Hubler is here. Hello, David. Hello. Hi. George Case the Third is here. Hi, everyone. And I'm here. Uh, Alan Blumkin is due. Yeah, I just called in. Oh, hey, Al. Hi, everyone. Hey, Alan. Your voice. I'm going to introduce the man himself by asking the question that I enjoy doing every Tuesday night. I ask Mr. Bach, what's the score? Well, I'll tell you, the score today is uh, a discussion of... uh, a guy who's irritated me for a long time, and his name is Bill me? James. Uh, not me, he irritated right? me for quite some time. <laughs> okay. Because uh, he came up with uh, uh, an approach to baseball which I don't necessarily subscribe to. It's called analytics. It's called sabermetrics. And it's uh, advanced math applied to uh, the, the simple and wonderful game of baseball. And uh, baseball bought into this uh, theory because baseball is always looking – for the next big thing, and uh, last week, uh, James came up with a crackerjack idea. He said that uh, baseball would go on even if we eliminate all of the current players because it, it would be just as popular as ever. Well, now, I certainly uh, yield to no one in my love of the game, the game as I learned it, the game as George Case's father played it. Um, and I think that was what he was trying to say, but he ruffled an awful lot of feathers because, you know, to compare uh, uh, replacement players, which we tried once and failed when they had the strike, uh, to compare them with the current major leaguers is foolishness. It's like comparing community theater to Broadway. It's not the same. The, the players that are in the major leagues have unique talent and unique ability, and that's why we watch the game. And for James to suggest that we could get rid of all of these guys and just play anybody, you, me, and David and George, uh, uh, it would be just as good. Well, it wouldn't be just as good. Uh, I'm not as good as any of the players who are playing today. Uh, I just... I'm not. If I were, I'd be in the major leagues. So I thought that was a very foolish statement for him to make. He got a lot of players angry, uh, and um, he backed off pretty quick. He deleted it. It came in the Twitter, and he deleted deleted it rather quickly and kind of apologized for it. But it was just a stupid thing for him to say, and I wish he had stayed in the warehouse where he used to work. He was a night watchman in a cannery warehouse in Ohio, and uh, that was where he came up with all these wonderful theories. So if he had stayed in the cannery warehouse, we would have all been a lot better off. That's my opinion, and I'm opening it for discussion. Okay. Uh, well, let me you know what? Let me jump in here a second, Hal, because first of all, I want to I want to compliment you on, on your on your piece that you wrote. I thought it was great. Um, and Alan and I were both, uh, you know, we were both Saber members. Um, <clears throat> Saber does a lot of wonderful things. I'm not I'm not blessed with uh, knowledge of the analytical part of baseball. My knowledge was from a playing point of view and the history of the game. That's what I always enjoyed, and and I think how you've hit upon quite a subject there. And I think it came from uh, I believe it was it you, David, last last week or whatever mentioned that crazy comment by bill james i mean i don't quite understand it to be honest with you i don't you know he was he was terrific as far as the studying the history of the game and and doing all these things but to make some kind of a comment like that uh with regard to the players i i think it's an affront to the players it's a front to the history of the game i mean you you reach a certain skill level when you reach the major leagues and and you're certainly not going to have that skill level as hal has pointed out uh, even close to being when you have a a person who is a replacement player, or <laughs> I think David, you've mentioned yeah. uh, something about beer vendors. I mean, that, to me, that's just 
That's crazy. I don't well, you know, understand. Well, sure. And, and he, he's putting statistics over the actual playing on the field. Um, and in a sense, you can almost understand it because it's his baby. But on the other hand, no one would go to the games. I mean, it would be preposterous. I think Hal's 100% right. I mean, people go to see incredible ball playing. They don't go to see some guy standing around on first base uh, who, who belongs on a sandlot in a, a softball team, a pickup right. softball team. Uh, it's, and, and so you can use the same statistics with him that you could with um, uh, anybody in the major leagues. It's ridiculous. Uh, can I suggest something that uh, Bill James Ralph, made yeah. it? Al, l- let me talk for okay, a guys, yeah. I, I, I just want to say that Bill James probably made those statements as a representation of management. He, after all, is a home office employee or um, a Boston Red Sox uh, employee. He's in management. And I think it's basically the meat on the hoof type attitude. That was a book uh, about Alabama in the the 60s. Texas. (laughs) Was it Texas? Yeah, yeah. I read that a couple of times, yeah. Yeah, terrific book. It notes that players are looked at by management as simply meat, meat on the hoof. And what James was saying reflects management's attitude that trying to keep down the salaries and suggesting that the game is the game and the stars uh, mean nothing and they're just transitory, and I think that's what he was trying to reflect. As for his analytics... I'm going to let you guys discuss that. Okay. Basically, let me say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, uh, he is not a big fan of war. You know, Brian Kennedy and, uh, and those, those people on the MLB. Uh, when he started, you know, get, gave me the things I got out of it that I thought he was good at. He, uh, when he came out with his first uh, big book in 1984, uh, he, well, abstract. Yeah, the the the, 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 the abstract of the, uh, the historical abstract. Uh, right. He did rate players by both peak and uh, career. You know, player could have had three, or four, or five good year, very good years, but didn't do very much. Uh, one of the uh, uh, standards he used was like uh, Yogi Berra and Roy Campanella. Campanella had several really very, very good years, but he was hurt a couple of times, and the uh, couple of years that were terrible. Yogi was, you know, for the most part, consistent on the way through. The other thing he did uh, was bring out uh, uh, the importance of uh, on-base percentage, which is something nobody would really looked at uh, for years and years and years. And I think it's, you know, it's key to evaluating a a uh, player like Wade Boggs, for example, uh, would get uh, would re- re- reach base 300 times a year between 200 hits and 100 walks. You know, and he had an uh, on base that, uh, even though he was not a real power hitter, he led the league several times in, uh, uh, in on base percentage, which contributed to uh, to the team. Uh, certain things I didn't agree with. The big one I never agreed with was. Uh, uh, range factor when it comes to fielding because I feel that fielding uh, and chances is, is a function of the types of pitches that the team has. Yeah, the example I use all the time is that the years in the 50s, Richie Ashburn made more putouts than Duke Snyder or Willie Mays. Now, anybody with half a brain knows... Fly ball pitch, uh, he had fly ball pitchers. Yeah, he had fly ball pitchers. Robin Roberts was a perfect example of a fly ball pitcher. So the and, that's a, to me, range, range factor... Now what? Yeah, range factor is something I didn't believe in. But they've gone much what? too far. They've gone much too no. far over over what he put out, uh, put out uh, you know, 35, 40 years ago. They've gone way past that. What were you saying, Hal? Well, I, I didn't understand Alan's point. The ball is hit to me, I catch the ball. If it's yeah. hit to the other guy, he catches the ball. What is what is the mathematical formula for that? None. I have no idea. I'm, 
a number of years ago, Sabre gave me a, a baseball journal to edit. The historical stuff I went through very quickly. The mathematical stuff, you're talking to somebody who had struggled to get through G, uh, algebra in high school. Uh, Didn't we all? Uh, I didn't know. I, I couldn't do any of that. Now you worked for IBM. No, I, I was a... Uh, uh, I was a, uh, yeah, I, I wasn't a scientist or anything, or a, ma a mathematician there. Okay, but, but what did you do for IBM? IBM is, math. is all math, isn't it? No. Sales. Golf? S no, systems engineering. I did that kind of thing. It wasn't mathematical. The mathematical people were all up in the, the headquarters in Armonk. I was never there. My math math skills, when it's, a, when it's addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and percentages, that's where it ended. I understand has, that. But has anybody come up with a defensive stat that really makes sense? No, really none of this makes sense to me. The defensive stuff doesn't make any sense to me at all. So why well, does baseball embrace this? Who knows? How do I know? They're just rolling head over heels. Yeah, it's part of analytics. Yeah. yeah, that's it. It's part of war. They made it. You're, you're, you're Bobby Gritch. Who you look at Bobby Gritch's numbers, and you say, why is this guy ranked in the top 25 players of all time? By the war people, he is. Okay. It's, it's insane. Uh, what's, um, what's the one thing about war that, um, that people go for? What? What is it about war? Rather? Okay, supposedly a definition is if the player was out, that the, 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 the average player who would replace him at the position, it's supposed to be an indication of whether, whether uh, the, guy, the guy who's injured is better or worse than the, the average player that would uh, be at the position. So if you have a guy so who can't see it. I know, you, it's you, crazy. Give you here. Wait a minute. Give me a minute. Okay, so sure. the average player and and replacing the other player, right? The starter. Yeah. So let's see. Let's see about the Yankees. The, the, the my one of my unfavorite teams, the Yankees. <laughs> they once had a first baseman named Wally Pip, and he was a starter. And he had a headache one day, and they put in a guy named Lou Gehrig. And Lou Gehrig played twenty one hundred and thirty straight games. Was he better than Wally Pip? I would say so. Yeah. Well, what's Wally Pip's war? Minus? I have no it idea. Make any sense. All, all, all I know about it is if you have a defensive player like Dick Stewart who can't, you know, who makes a million errors, his his uh, his, uh, his defensive war is zero. The the the, the, the war for all these DHs is zero because they never play the field. It's a meaningless statistic. It's I know it's a me. I, I find it totally meaningless. Well, remember, remember what Jerry Seinfeld said. Whoa, what's it good for? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. I, agree, I totally agree with that. I'm just trying to say, uh, Bill James, what Bill James started with in 1979 and 80 or whenever, uh, the, the, the way they use this stuff now has gone a lot further. Yes. And he has a dream. Mm -hmm. uh, it's made a lot. Uh, you know, he was never into this nonsense with the pitching changes every two two seconds and uh, you know, all the rest of it. I mean, you, you, you guys are all from the fifties. You saw Ted Kluzowski play first base and lead the league every year with nine ninety six, and Gil Hodges play first base and make some errors. It didn't take uh, a rocket science to tell you that Gil Hodges had more range than that than Ted Kluzowski. Well, he got the balls that Kluzowski, he got the balls that, uh, Kluzowski couldn't get to. Yeah, but you, like can tell that from your, you can tell that from your eyes. You, know, you, don't, have to, you don't need a 500-page uh, war graph to tell you this. There you go, Alan. It's the test, the eye test. Yeah, I know, yeah. That's I always used. Yeah, you, 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 don't, need, you don't need a 15-page essay to tell you this. That's right. Why is it? The, the, the game is so simple. Why make it so complicated? Because there's money to game. be made. There's it's money to be made. How much are they paying Brian Kenny, MLB? To, I mean, Sabre runs this analytical conference out in Phoenix every month. Every, every, excuse me, every March. And they, they bring Brian Kenny. I wouldn't pay a, two, a dime to listen to him. 
Yeah. Any time I see him on the TV, I put on MOB, and I see him, I turn it, I turn the station. He's obviously got uh, got a lot of followers. Yeah, I don't subscribe to it certainly, but uh, people do, and I, and I don't understand why. I yeah, I don't think any. Get it. I, I don't think very many people in our age bracket, uh, you know. Uh, well, they're not looking for our age bracket, bracket. They're looking for millennials. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, so know, they put out something complex. You know, they figure that uh, they can't simplify this without going through all these mathematical equations and stuff. I know. It's just. I know you're uh, right. It's yeah. It's not for our generation. No, I know. Yeah. Guys, there's one simple stat that is terrific of the new age analytics. And I don't know how um, radical it is, but OPS plus on base uh, on base plus slugging is OPS. OP, OPS. So with the, with, with the bringing up the the uh, on base percentage added to the slugging percentage, that's OPS. And basically, you can tell a player's offensive worth by that stat. Yeah, if you if a player has an OPS over one point zero zero zero. Yeah, he's a superstar. There you now, go with the math again. That's, yeah. That r- works in reverse for players. Sure. You can you have, a, you have you the, up. But don't you, t- you have a, a you have you have, you have an pl- offensive I, I player power. who hits 300 but g- is, uh, gives you no extra base power and never walks. You know, a guy who walks a. Uh, watch if you watch a game. If you watch games. Yeah. You recognize who the stars are and who the stars are not. Sure, right? sure. It's not hard. It's really not. It's the eye test. Can a guy make plays? Can a guy hit balls? It's an eye test. It's what he does. You don't need a formula for that. No, I know that. Formulas for that. That's ridiculous. You're, you're preaching to how you're preaching to the converted. I know <laughs> that. I know that. I'm just, you know. Yeah, I know. Getting yeah. it off my chest. Yeah. Now, I have a friend of mine who's a huge Yankee fan. He hated Bobby Richardson because Bobby Richardson had a career on base of 299, and his rebounding leadoff cost Mantle tons of RBIs. Well, That's just his, his reason. I think if, if you ask Yankee fans, long-time Yankee fans, they would say that Bobby Richardson was one of the best second basemen and one of the best Yankees in, in the history of the franchise. That's not, true. He's not in, a, in the class of Mantle and DiMaggio, but... He was a terrific player for his time, and he did what he had to do, or did what he was supposed to do, and he played the position. He wasn't. He, he certainly was an improvement on Horace Clark, right? Oh yeah, mm-hmm. or, or Hector Lopez. Hector, what a yeah, pair right. of hands, Lopez! Hey, what a pair of hands! <laughs> it's the eye um, test. That's what I'm saying. It is. Yeah. yeah. You watch them, and you can tell who's good and who's not. And there's something else. Bobby Richardson came up big in the World Series, bigger than perhaps anybody. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah, when you're talking about a career, you have to f- factor in big games, clutch situations, um, all that stuff. It's, it goes beyond just simply what the guy does on the average. Look, Billy and, Martin was a 250 and 260 hitter. During the regular season, in the World Series that he played, and he, all of a sudden he became a superstar. And if you check it out, he yeah. outplayed. He outplayed in, Jackie uh, Robinson every time they faced each other. Four times they faced each other in the World Series. He outplayed Jackie Robinson. And I think he took a lot of pride in that. They shared yeah. a business manager, or yeah, was he better than Jackie Robinson as a ball player? Of course not. But for that particular the, the, the World Series. He, somehow he managed to turn it up uh, a whole bunch of notches. And that's the, the magic of what we're talking about. Yeah, that's but that's the, magic that's the eye. You know. unpredictable, boys. Yeah, it's exactly. That's what's wonderful about our game. You don't know what you're going to – what did Casey Stengel say? Yeah. Come to the ballpark, you'll see something you never saw before. It's unpredictable. Right. That's the magic of baseball, in my view. That's what I love about the game. You don't know what's going to happen next. No. You guys remember in in New York in the in the papers during the World Series they had the Daily Goat. Yeah, yeah the Daily Daily News that the hero and the goat. Yeah. Bill Gallo, and, that's right. Bill 
Yeah. You know, Bill Gallo, and right. Bill Gallo, yeah. Not only were they well drawn, and you're a big uh, Gallo man, Miss, Mr. Bach. You wrote a bo- book about him. No. Well, I wrote a book about no. Willard Mullen, but I had Gallo oh, oh. did the introduction. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Those guys are all gone, too. The yes, cut, they Facebook, are. Facebook sports cartoonists. Yeah. Yeah, you don't see them anymore very often. That was the highlight of the sporting news for me. Oh, yeah. That it, every Thursday it would come in the mail, and uh, boy, do I miss that publication. As it was, it's evolved into a typical magazine, a sports, sports magazine. That's you know, when I started carrying oil racing, that's when I dropped it. <laughs> Good <laughs> point. Good point. But the goat and the hero thing... And the reason I brought it up was that the players you expected to appear as either the GOAT or the hero in the back of your mind never were the ones. And that's the beauty of the game, the unpredictability of it as Hal says. Of course, sure. Um, George, talk talk about stats in your dad's day. Was there anything – I mean, talk about defensive stats – practically non-existent, but there was, I'm guessing, kind of a reputation factor. Your dad knew who the great outfielders were and who the weak outfielders were. Well, you know, Ralph, you you touch upon something with me. I mean, I'm the son of a former player, so I have a different perspective. I I don't get into all the stats and all that kind of stuff. I, I agree with Hal and what Alan's talking about the eye test. I mean, ball players they know they know talent. They know a guy can play. And and you know, when my dad was a base runner, I mean, he knew he studied the pitchers. He studied and 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 knew how much of a lead he could take, or he knew the catcher, what kind of throwing arm he had, or whether he was accurate or whatever. I mean, that's what they did. That was the eye test. There wasn't anybody that was going to be sitting in the in the dugout with with Bucky Harris or when Stengel was there that was the a bench coach going through a computer printouts they just didn't do that they they evaluated the talent on the field by what as Hal said what that guy could do and you know that's my my whole perspective uh you know my dad never never taught me never sat down with me about statistics on anybody and uh you know he just would say hey this guy can play or, or that guy can't play i mean that's just the way they evaluated talent and there was a story, I think it was uh, from when Joe Gordon was playing second base for Joe McCarthy, and McCarthy called Gordon over to, there's some sports writers or something, he said, hey, Joe, he said, uh, tell everybody what your batting average is. And, and Gordon said, I don't know. And he said, well, tell everybody what your uh, RBI totals are. He said, I don't know. And McCarthy said, that's why I love Joe Gordon. He's just out there to play. He doesn't care about those stats. He just wants to play ball. And, you know, that's my that's my perspective on this whole Sabre analytics and, and Bill James. And, and I applaud Bill James for the his study of the history and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, now I think it's way overblown, and, and it drives me crazy to hear all these terms. I don't even know what half the terms mean. Uh, you know, and, and and it's become to me a lot of uh, computer guys and a lot of MBAs, and they're 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 analyzing the game from a from a management point of view, I assume. But on the other hand, uh, you know, the players are ones who play the game, and 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 as Allen and David and and Hal and you, Ralph, have mentioned, I mean, a guy does it on the field. Uh, I mean, I can tell you that, you know, if his range, I think there was a a comment you just the other day about shortstops, and, and we're talking about Lou Boudreau. Hey, he didn't have great range, but he knew how to play the position, and that to me is what's important. And, and so did Alvin Dock and Dick Rote. Yeah, I mean, the same right. thing, Alan. Yeah. I agree. I mean, you, yeah. you know if you're an infielder and you have to shade or whatever, that's what you do. And and, and, and you look at a pitcher, and, and I, if you watch baseball – you like the second baseman, the shortstop, they're going to signal each other, open mouth, closed mouth, yeah. whatever it is, based upon the pitch. Because it might be that that hitter is, is a good low ball inside hitter, and the pitcher, the scouting report says, hey, go to the outside on the guy. So that's what they're going to try to do. And, and to me, that's the study of the game 
It's from a player's point of view, not yeah, from a, a statistical analysis point of view. Yeah, that's my, Dick that's Rowe my told me that he had, he had to learn to hit and run because they were batting him second, and uh, he was uh, you know, not the fastest guy a foot. So in order to compensate for that, because if he hit a ground ball with the man on first base, it would, it would probably probably be a double play. They say he learned how to hit and run because uh, because of uh, you know his slowness. He compensated for that and uh, became one of the better hit and run players uh, of his time. That's a very good point, Alan. They do yeah. hit and run. You know, you learn. And, and today, you talk to a lot of fans and they're or talk to players about a hit and run. They say, "What the hell are you talking about?" You know, that's hitting behind the runner. You're not trying to put one into the seats because that's what the you know the stat, stats will tell you. But but if you're playing the game, that's how the game is played. And how and I have talked about this so many times. It's the fundamentals that 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 players use when they're playing the game if they understand and know the game and what their strengths and weaknesses are as a player and what their job is. I know my father. Hey, my father was a, was no power at all. But he was a leadoff guy, and his his job, because Washington had to play small ball, his job was to get on base, steal, or do whatever he had to get into second base and get in scoring position, and that's what he did. And and for for four years, he scored over 100 runs, and in one year, he led the league. And he wasn't a he wasn't a terrific hitter. He was about a 280 hitter or whatever. But he knew his he knew his job and what he had to do, and that's what he did. He thinks anybody thinks. Casey Stengel would have brought in Ryan Matson into the World Series three times to give up seven and on a eight and Harry the You know, to me, not. Alan, somebody somebody was 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 putting that kind of stuff in in their head about. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, and, you know, and, and yet if you were a Casey Stengel or Bucky Harris or Walter Austin, whatever it is, you know, you're looking and say, okay, well, what do I need to do now? I don't yeah. need somebody with a computer printout telling me what to do. It, it my boggles, eyesight tells watching me. Watching some of these guys manage the today right. boggles the mind. It really yeah. does. Yeah. You know, we said before that the, the players know, and I think a lot of the players dismiss this uh, new age statistics and stuff. I had conversations with a, a number of ball players who were base stealers, and the one that sticks in mind is uh, Jose Reyes, who was with the Mets. And I asked him, tell me how to steal a base. I, you know, I'm a big guy, but I'd like to know how to steal a base. Could you break it down for me? And he, he broke it down, how he studied the pitcher, how, the, how he studied moves, when the pitcher would throw over, whether right. the pitcher would throw over, and where the you – know, he just – very analytical mind, but it wasn't, it wasn't mathematics. It was his eyes. He'd watch – and he'd analyze and he'd decide when to go. All, all great the great base stealers were like that. Yeah. All yeah. the great base stealers yeah. are like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I, 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 I couldn't. The story of Alan, Alan and, and David, I couldn't agree with that comment more. I mean, that's what base stealers do. You study. I mean, I can tell you. I mean, that's. I used to sit there and watch games and, and be with my dad and just listen to him talk about it because that was his background. That's what he did. He wasn't sitting and in, in looking at some kind of a printout and said, oh, man, this guy's got an OBS of three point, whatever it is. He said, man, look at that. That, that pitcher, you know when you can run on him or you know you can jump. Exactly. That's you know, exactly that kind right. of thing. That's what they do. Yeah, I'm sure that's that. Tell the story of your dad's tell stealing bases, and who pointed it out to him? Well, you know what? Uh, it, it, where, he, where he studied, and he was fortunate because the, his mentor, my dad's mentor, was Clyde Milan. And, you know, many people, you know, older fans probably never even heard of Clyde Milan, but Clyde Milan was a contemporary of, of uh, you know, Ty Cobb. And, matter of fact, two, two years, I think, uh, uh, Clyde Milan uh, won the stolen base ground. So uh, he was brought out of retirement by Clark Griffith because Clark Griffith knew that my dad had, had great natural speed, but he had to develop his talent as a base runner, and Clyde Milan was able to do that and, and teach him to, to look for the uh, telltale signs of a pitcher, whether you can go, not go, how many, how many uh, additional – steps or whatever you can take leading off depending upon you know how the first baseman is playing you 
dependent upon the pitcher's move, dependent upon the catcher, whether he's got a good arm or whether he's uh, just uh, somebody who who's throws and has no idea where he's going. If you're a base runner, you get a good jump. I, I mean, I've shown, I've shown a couple pictures on Facebook of my dad stealing a base at Yankee Stadium. He's three-quarters away to second base, and the throw hasn't even been made. And that's what a base stealer does. Yeah, the new wife statistics, I think, are also used by uh, Scott Boris and the rest of the agents, you know, to, uh, when they're going to negotiate a contract or prepare for arbitration. Have, the, the players' uh, agents have to have to use this stuff as a counterbalance to the owners. Yeah. Well, I, I don't, hey, Alan, I don't disagree with that. And, and yeah. those agents are doing their job because they're getting a piece of the action. So, you know, the, yeah. the better a contract that they can get for that player, the more money they're going to make as an agent. Yeah, we had Scott Boris uh, at uh, one of our national conventions a, a number of years ago, and he said that, uh, you know, the time that he puts in with his people uh, to, you know, to, to prepare for this, the, these things is incredible. But that, he said that they... He has to do it to get the best deal he possibly can for his client. Right. Well, the Mets just hired, as Hal probably knows, an assistant GM whose qualifications are strictly being able to analyze the analytics. What say you about that, Hal? They bought into it. They're not the only team that's done that. Uh, you know, most teams have bought into analytics. And that's why the game is not the same, and, and I resent it. I don't like it. I mean, I'll sit and watch baseball because it's baseball, but I really would like to see a hit and run now and then. I'd really like to see a squeeze bunt now and then. I almost fell off my chair during the season when uh, the Mets pulled a suicide squeeze. I hadn't seen it in months, and they, you know, it worked, and they got a run out of it, and, and I was so excited by it. Because it's a lost art. It's it's part of the the lost game that we that we uh, we sadly no longer uh, are exposed to. And, and the uh, pitch counts drive me crazy. Oh, uh, it drives uh, absolutely crazy. I mean, the devaluation of stars, the devaluation of cle- of complete games. I mean, it's just well, you know. that's become like platoon football. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a very good point. It's become platoon baseball. You're right. Yep. I agree. I have a I have a question about the um, the switch. You know, um, what do they call it when these guys uh, shift get in? Oh, the shift. Yeah. Yeah, the shift. Okay. Yeah. A baseball player is taught to. In his head, before the pitch, think, what am I going to do with the ball if it's hit to me? If it's hit slow, what am I going to do to me? If it's hit fast, what am I, where am I going to throw it? Who's going to cover? You get the shift. You, They may hit the ball to you, but what you do with it from the position you catch the ball in, which may be uh, you're out in right field, you're the second baseman, you're out in right field, you're going to catch it. You're not thinking with the shift, what am I going to do with the ball anymore? You're, the main thought is to get over to where you're supposed to be. So I think they're cutting off balls, they're, um, but they're not turning the play as much. I, yeah, I would, Tommy Hendrick was once said, catching a ball is fun. Knowing what to do with it afterwards is a business. Uh, <laughs> Very good point. Very yeah, that's a good that's a good statement, Alan. I hadn't heard yeah. that before. That, that's a that's very much of a of a truism when it when it comes to baseball. That's for sure. And also, you guys mentioned one of you mentioned the double play combination and how they work together and they know the nuances. It used to be a double play combination wasn't great until they were together for four or five years and learned all these things about each other. Now, I mean, they throw it together in, in a spring training. All of a sudden, you have a, have a new partner, and um, in two days, you may have another new partner, depending on who's in there the next day. And um, So I can't believe what we're getting as a fan 
is the quality of game that it was when these guys worked together as teammates. And I, I'm thinking of the Halberstam book um, on all these guys. Uh, even Goldenbach wrote, wrote a book on, on teammates and um, the effectiveness of staying together for a long time. Uh, do you think we're getting a reduced product because of that? Start with you, David. The fans, the fans know because wow. attendance went below 70 million this year, and in my mind, that's for baseball. That's the bottom line, and in my mind, they've got to be aware of the fact that less people are going to the games because the games aren't as entertaining, in my view, uh, as they once were. Now, you mentioned the double play. Let's put a man on first base, and a left-handed hitter comes to the plate, the pull hitter, as many left-handed hitters are. They shift. We put three guys on the right side of the infield, right? The first baseman, the second baseman, and the third baseman moves over to where the second baseman Short ordinarily stop. would be, right? Now, that leaves one guy on the left side, the shortstop, right? Now, let's say that the batter... Third base. Yeah. But the, the, the third baseman usually oh, the third moves, baseman the right moves over to the, the right side. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, All right. Whatever. There's one yeah. guy on the left side, whoever he is. Now, let's say the batter hits a, a routine ground ball to the right side, and the ball is fielded. It's a double play ball, except that the guy on the left side is pulled so far over that he can't get to second base to turn the double play. Or let's say that that guy on the left side, is he's stationed somewhere between second and third base. The guy on the left side, there's a pop fly foul, let's say, in third baseline, down the third base side. He's got to run like hell to try and catch up with a little pop fly that should be an out. And more times than not, it falls un, untouched. That's not baseball. That's some kind of a hybrid game that they've invented. It's not something that I really subscribe to, and it's a right. problem. Very, very good point, Hal. That, um, it cha- and I don't think there are def- defensive drills to account for every switch. In other words, uh, learning is reps, as far as I'm concerned, in everything, not just baseball. You've got to go over things over and over <laughs> again. You repeat get better, how are you going to get better? And if the third baseman is the only guy covering um, that, the double play that you described, and he's a third baseman by trade, not a shortstop, how good is he going to be in completing that double play? Even if he has a good arm, that's a question. If, if we all can see that, don't the people who run baseball see this? Pardon me? Don't the people who run baseball, the general managers, and the owners, don't they see what we see? The problems that we're bringing up here? Boy, hey guys, does anybody notice that we're having technical problems? Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, uh, we are, you are breaking up, Hal, and I think unless I'm breaking up as well, and David isn't, and Al isn't, George, uh, are you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here. here, but we, it has been breaking up. You're absolutely yeah. right. Uh, I'm going to ask you, Hal, would you hang up and call back? Uh, yeah, I'll do that if you want, sure. Yeah, because your connection do that? is real, really fuzzy. I, I would would like that. I'm and in the meantime, right And in the meantime, we're going to take a little pause for the cause. Um, everybody stay where you are. I'm going to push a button to take us to break. Um, It's the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. I'm Ralph Tycho. The show is Ask Bach. (laughs) What's something, whatever the show is. It's a a long time. Bach score. Bach score. I'm going to push a button, and we'll we'll rejoin as soon as Hal gets I'm back. back. You're back. I don't even have to push a button. Okay. I've returned. And you sound much better. So, Good. Um, would you repeat what you were saying before you broke up? Well, what I said was, 
with defensive shifts that have become so popular in the game today, uh, they, they uh, of course, they have inherent problems because if you have three guys on the right side of the infield and there's a runner on first base and the batter hits a ground ball, a routine ground ball, which ordinarily would be a double play, the player who fields the ground ball and turns to second base won't find anybody at second base because everybody shifted over to the right side. The one guy on the left side of the infield can't make it to second base. That's one problem. Then there's another problem. That guy on the left side of the infield, and I've seen this happen, is stationed kind of between the old shortstop position, between second and third. Now let's say there's a little pop fly on the third base side, right in foul territory, which the third baseman ordinarily would be there to catch. The shortstop, or the guy who's playing shortstop now, runs like hell, and he probably is not going to get there in time. And I've seen that play, too. So they've changed the game. They've changed the nature of the game. And and this is what irritates me. Uh, and I, I, I yearn for the old-time baseball that, that George remembers and Alan remembers and David remembers, and so do you, Ralph. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's sad more than anything else. Uh, that's the best way because kids well, are not seeing understand. the product. Kids are not seeing the excellence of teamwork like we saw as kids. And, and if uh, we see these problems, you mean to tell me that management doesn't see this, and yet they they follow it right down the line. They they don't change their ideas. I don't understand it. Yeah, how you know what I, I agree with you, and and my thinking is that a lot of the you know the management, the upper management. I'm not talking about the field manager, but the the management, the guys who are sitting in the in the boxes and and all yeah, that kind of stuff. I mean, they're they're not they're not former players. I mean, to me, a lot of them are, are analytical, or, or they're MBAs, or Harvard, or Yale, or whatever the Ivy League schools that are that are you know putting out the product. But they're they're not a former player, and I can tell you, I mean, I mean, I might be an old timer because my dad played in a different era, but I can tell you that the players knew how to play the game, and the fundamentals were so much a part of the game, which I think is is sorely lacking today. And I really appreciate your comment about suicide squeeze. I mean, that was a strategy that was employed for decades: the suicide squeeze. I, I can't tell you. The last time I ever saw one, and if you saw one that was successful, Hal, that was terrific because that's a very exciting so part. <laughs> it's yeah. true. I mean, I, you know, they, they've, they've changed the game and the basics of the game, and right. I don't know if it'll ever change back. You know, I don't know if they'll ever revert. I hope so. Well, well they I did. Know. You know, at times you went from a dead ball era to a lively ball. You went from, uh, you know, a game where there weren't many home runs to, a, you know, a lot of home runs, and then and then to a game where pitching was dominant. And now it seems to be back to to where you got tremendous home runs because that's what the guys are being paid ten billion dollars a year to do. Uh, and you got pitch counts where you got the pitchers coming in and and getting a quality start for a six inning, to, you know, which to me is just absolutely ridiculous. But that's what they do. And somebody's calling those shots. And I don't think it's necessarily the, the players or the managers. I think it's above that. And and they're coming up with these crazy stats and all these kind of things, which are to me. I mean, I guess if you're a fan, maybe, or you're you're somebody who analyzes baseball. You know, you want to know all that kind of stuff. You know, I personally don't. I don't give a damn. Pardon my French about exit velocity and, and launch angles and all that. I don't care about that. I, you know, I want to see a guy who knows what to do with the bat. He knows how to protect the plate. He, he's got two strikes. He, he's going to try to, to make contact. He's not going to be trying to hit one out just because you know, the fans want to see a home run. The, fa- the fantasy leagues have been uh, also very, very uh, disruptive. Because uh, the, the, you know, if you participate in the fantasy league, that's the only thing. The only thing you care about is is, is certain numbers. You know. Yeah. Right. And well, that's uh, probably true, Alan. I'm yeah. not a I'm not a fantasy player. The game when I played, 
you know, I I played like a lot of us. We played that All Star Baseball, which was created by yeah. you know, Ethan Allen, which oh, yeah, was a former yeah, player. Yeah. A terrific game. I mean, we yeah, played I know, for yeah, yeah, hours. I used to play that all, all the time. Yeah, I mean, it uh, was a great a great game. And it, no, and when, it when, when that, yeah, when the fantasy leagues first started, I was I was offered. I can't count the number of times I was offered to go. Uh, you know, tr- that people try to get me to play in one. I just turn them down all the time. Right. And uh, I-, I have no, uh, you know, I- I have better things to worry about than who was the 26th player, 25th player on San Diego or be up, this is before the Internet days, or be up till 5 o'clock in the morning waiting for a box score of, uh, of uh, a West Coast game to come in. Yeah. Well, that is a different world. I mean, I've never been a part of it. I don't play it. I don't play fantasy football. I don't play fantasy football. I don't baseball. play any of that. I, mean, I, I, just, I just love the game for what it is, and I enjoy it if I'm watching it or playing or whatever. But I'm I'm with you. I'm not staying up till 5 o'clock in the morning to get the scores to see if my fantasy team is going to you know, be a winner or loser or I'm going to be the, the, the greatest new general manager, which is a fantasy. I, mean, I know, you know, yes. Yeah. You're a fantasy. You're not. You're not the actual player. I know that. You're yeah. playing a game that's based upon what they call it fantasy. That's exactly what it is, in my opinion. For real. One, one, another thing that drives me nuts is when you have a runner on second base with nobody out, and the next batter either hits a ground ball to third or short, or strike. The runner it takes off at third. Yeah. yeah. The runner doesn't take off at third because, you know, the, the ball isn't hit. The what? No, I've seen the, that, and that drives me. The strand of the second base. Right. Ball, yeah, so, I've seen ball. so many times when a, ball, a ground ball is hit to the shortstop or third base, the runner on second takes off the third. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thrown out. No. It's crazy. You, you, were, all, you were always taught, you were always taught you don't run when the ball is in front, front of you. you. Right. You know, I mean, that's, what the, that's that's a fundamental. I mean, if if you have to run because you got a guy on first, that means he's coming down. But on yeah. the other hand, if, if you're standing on second base by well, yourself and a sure. ball hit in front of you, you stay there. I mean, of there's course. no reason to run. And I've oh, seen uh, that happen so many times right. that it just drives me to distraction. You're right. Yep. Of course, if it's it's a force play right. third, you have to run. But if there's right. just a runner on second. Uh, you know, the saddest thing about all of this that we've been talking about, and I'm in total agreement with all, the saddest part about it is there are so many great ball players out there these days. These guys are so terrific, and we're, mi- we're missing the forest for the trees because too many people are too interested in these nonsense statistics to, to miss the, the actual beauty of the game. Because some, I mean, I'm amazed by some of these shortstops' arms to first base. I mean, no, no, it, you know what, David? David, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I and I'm not, I'm going to get off my soapbox, but the players are so much better physically. You know, they're they're terrific. They're great yeah. skills. But on the other hand, fundamentally, you know, you talked about players being fundamental, and it's a fundamental thing that you learn how to play the game. And these guys are so much better. But if they would just have somebody teach right. them a little bit more about what the game is all about, you know, it'd be sensational. And I'm with, yes. I'm with Hal. I mean, I can't see people come into a game to watch the beer vendors play the, the game, to tell you the truth. Right. I mean, they want to see the talent that's on the field and what these guys can do. Some of the, some of the moves, some of the players, I've seen the outfielders and the infielders, I mean, sensational plays. And, and, yep. and they're so much more skilled than in the past. But on the other hand, again, the fundamentals are just lacking, or somebody is not teaching them how to play the game. This, this past season, that's the whole story, this past right? season, there were there were more strikeouts than hits. Right. Yep. Yep. Wow. That to me, that to wow. me is crazy, Alan. You're yeah, absolutely is. right. Yeah. Something yeah. wrong with that? There's something wrong with that. Something yep. definitely wrong. When DiMaggio had less strikeouts than home runs in a career, or just about the same, or um, something like that. Um, that's craziness. But I will say you guys are right about one thing. Athletically, defensively, we're seeing stuff that is just incredible. Yes. Every day you see a highlight film of catches made the previous night. That's right. Of the yeah, guys they're all great ones. Eh? Remarkable. Some, I, remember, I forget who it was who made this full speed uh, running catch uh, just off the top of his shoes. I mean, he was going full speed and 
just leaned down and picked it off the ground before it hit the ground. I mean, it was yeah, and guys, with elevation getting over the fence to pull yeah. the run. Oh, yeah. Mookie Betts and, um, and a myriad of other guys. Um, yes, that's it. There's so many of them. It's not right. just one. Uh, you know, any game you watch these days, you're going to see some incredible playing. You so, might see some dumbhead running, base running. And, uh, that's right. I was very guys. good at that. That's one of their specialties is bad base running. <laughs> Who, who's that, Al? Pirates. Oh, the Pirates. You're yeah. a Pirate fan, yes. Yeah. Um, I, um, I'm glad we covered the good good things that people are getting from baseball. Uh, I'm glad we didn't didn't let that go by because we're a bunch of old guys hungering for the past and the things that we hunger for have to admit that um, the youth of America doesn't know from that. They, they don't know about hit, taking two and hit one to right to get the yeah. guy over on, on the right side where the whole name of the game was get on, get over, and get in. And the yeah. home run came almost as a surprise. And now they are teaching. The reason they don't have time to teach fundamentals as we know it, they're teaching elevation angles in the minors and spending buku time on that because that's what, translates, transcends to the pay, the pay board. Yeah, they're, they're also teaching pitchers in the low minor leagues, starting pitchers how to go five innings <laughs> and look for bullpen help at the first line of trouble. Right. Hey, bef- before we sign off, I have a correction to make. I misidentified. Last week I said that Patty Chayefsky had been a sports writer um, and uh, gave it up because he said they, when they asked him why was he quitting, he said February. It was Paul Gallico who had been the Daily News uh, yeah. sports editor. And um, don't say yeah, you should have corrected me right then and there, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> so now I have to make a correction. It was Paul Gallico who then who gave up sports writing um, and went into writing novels. Yeah. And, and, oh, off topic, I don't know whether any of you saw the item. Uh, Willie Knowles passed away yesterday. Oh, oh no, I didn't. Oh, yeah, he's eighty-four. Yeah. I didn't see yeah. That. Oh. Number Where six. was he living in California? I thought. Yeah. I think he was from. Yeah. yeah. Number six in your program. U- UCLA. Yeah. And our Knickerbockers. Wow. That hurt. They all do. Wow. Oh, that, that one. He, today he's still better than most of the guys the Knicks have. Yeah. Out on the court. Hey, watch it. They've won three in a row, pal. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes, and they're playing tonight. I don't know what they're doing tonight. We're not playing the PSAL League? Stop it. <laughs> Stop it now, right now. My Uh-oh. Alan. Getting... Okay, how's going bad again? And we're yep. getting close to the end. Let me say something. You guys weren't around last week on Thanksgiving weekend, and or Thanksgiving week, and on all the shows, I just wanted to make note of how thankful I am personally, to get to share uh, you guys' company on a, on a regular basis. It's a big part of my life, and you guys are my extended family, and I'm grateful, thankful. That's what I wanted to tell you. Okay, next year it's at your house. Yep. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ralph. <laughs> thank, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ralph, thank you. Thank you. California, my thank house you. it is. <laughs> All right. Good sentiment. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. Okay. Um, this is great. We'll be back next week. And, um, Al, thank you very much. George Case, Al Blumkin, and David Hubler. I'm Ralph Tycho, Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, and we are out. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yep. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The proceeding was a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you for listening.